Hello and welcome to this webinar on screen placement after acquired brain injury. My name is Claudia Hillemand. I'm a partner in the child brain injury team in Bolt Burden Kemp. I represent children who have sustained a brain injury as a result of medical negligence. But in addition to that work, I also represent children and young people in education matters and where appropriate, I appeal decisions of local authorities and those decisions can be in relation to refusal to give my clients a plan, can be in relation to the contents of their plan or it can be about their school placements, which is the focus of our discussion today. So choosing a school for your child with special educational needs can be really daunting and overwhelming. And whether you are considering early years, primary school, secondary, post-16 or beyond, you know, there's lots of considerations for you to think about. And of course, when we say choosing a school, it usually means stating your, the school that you'd prefer your child to attend. So my hope today is that this webinar is going to give parents some guidance on things to think about when choosing their child's preferred school, and that it'll help you feel better prepared to make the right decision for your child. So I'm going to discuss the types of placements that are out there, choosing the right school with or without an education healthcare plan, the annual review process and tips for school placements. So as a starting point, does your child have an education healthcare plan? If not, do you think they need one? And if so, I would recommend that you start the process of requesting an education healthcare needs assessment as soon as possible. This session won't cover applying for an education healthcare plan. I've covered that in another webinar. It's called Securing and Protecting Your Child's Education Right and Introduction to EHCPs. So that might be useful if you're starting out on the journey. Nonetheless, I think this will be helpful. This webinar will be helpful in relation to placement issues. So a child or young person who has special educational needs but no EHCP must be educated in mainstream education subject to certain very limited exceptions. This talk's mainly going to assume that children have an EHCP detailing their needs, but it will also provide some of that guidance where there's no EHCP and it will give you some generic placement that can apply quite broadly to choosing primary, secondary and post-secondary schools with or without the EHCP input. But why does having an EHCP help when choosing a school? Well, a good plan will encapsulate your child's special educational needs and special education provision needed to meet those needs. That can be key to helping you and prospective schools know if they can meet the child or young person's needs. Also, if a child has an EHCP, they don't go through the usual placement process. So you don't have the same concerns about places being filled up um, really quickly. If the local authority names a school in your child's plan, that school must take your child. Having no places left is not a valid reason to refuse. And also having an EHCP can open up schools outside your local authority a little bit more easily. So some of the language around schools can be a bit confusing. And so I thought this slide might be helpful. When you hear about maintained schools, those are schools that are controlled by the local authority. When people talk about academies, they are controlled by the Secretary of State for Education. Some schools are controlled by neither, and those are usually independent schools or non-maintained special schools. Maintained and mainstream is not the same thing. So mainstream defines the type of provision. And as we've discussed, maintained refers to who controls the school. So the, the local authority in that instance. Briefly touching on academies, they are school controlled. They're funded by the Secretary of State by education. Although they're not maintained by local authorities, most of the laws still apply to them. And then I did mention independent schools and non-maintained schools. So independent schools are mostly controlled by charities and non-maintained special schools tend to take a mixture of children. They're mostly publicly funded and they take children with EHCPs. So it's helpful to know what's out there when trying to choose what's right for your child. So let's just quickly cover academies. Academies is an umbrella term. They receive funding directly from the government and they are run by an academy trust. 
they have more control over how they do things in community schools. But they're still inspected by Ofsted. And they still have to follow the same rules on admissions, special educational needs, exclusions, and students sit the same exams. Under this academy umbrella are free schools. A free school is a type of academy which is free to attend, but is not controlled by the local authority. Free schools receive state funding via the Education Funding Agency. Parents, teachers, businesses or charities can submit an application to the Department of Education to set up a free school. UTCs offer secondary age education for kids four to five, so 14 to 18 usually. Some start earlier at key stage three. They tend to offer um, supportive smaller school environments, as well as providing core subjects like English and maths and science. Each UTC has a link to uh, one or more specialisms, like technical specialisms, and they're linked to local industry partners. Studio schools are designed for 14 to 19 year olds of all abilities. They tend to be small schools of 300 students with all year round opening. And it's more like a nine to five working day than a school day. Others I've named up there are academy special schools, alternative provision academies, and academy boarding schools. So when we talk about maintained or state schools, we are talking about the list on that slide. So mainstream, special unit within mainstream, special schools, dual placements, APs or PRUs, residential placements, home education, hospital schools, post-16 institutions, and 19 plus provisions. There's lots there that can fall under maintained. If we start with mainstream, mainstream is defined as a school other than a special school. There's a fundamental principle underpinning the law that where a parent of a child with special educational needs or a young person with special educational needs wants a place in a mainstream setting, it must never be denied on the basis that mainstream is unsuitable or that their needs or disabilities are too great or too complex. That is known as the right to mainstream education. And I think a lot of that's reflected in the fact that in the statistics for 2022, 40.5% of pupils with EHCPs were in mainstream schools. Children without EHCPs must be educated in mainstream. There's very few exceptions, as I said. For example, you may want to pay for an independent school or homeschool. But the local authority must not put a child without an EHCP in a special school, except in very, very limited circumstances, and they need prior consent of the parents of the young people. If you have an EHCP, the local authority can only refuse to place in mainstream if that is your preference, or if it would be incompatible with efficient education of others, and there are no reasonable steps the LA could do or take to avoid this. So that means that an LA can't send a special, send your child to a special school if it's not what you want, even if it's supported by professionals. But I suppose what I would urge is for you to consider if in fact mainstream is the best option in those circumstances. There is a range of staffing and resources and curriculums in mainstream. And so I'd urge you to think about the things up on the slide, like what resources are available? Will my child have a peer group? What's the school focus and expectations? Is the environment safe for the, my child? What are the adult to child ratios? What are the staff qualifications? What kind of experience do the TAs have? What's the culture and attitude of the school? Is it right for my child? You can't assume that every teacher will be equipped and trained to effectively teach a child with special educational needs in mainstream. And in my personal experience, some of the parents of my clients have met with mainstream schools that they've found very unwelcoming, who have attempted to dissuade them from applying there. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't apply there, of course it doesn't, but what I would say is it might suggest you should delve a bit more into the culture of the school and really question if they're going to help and support your child develop. Are they going to provide a nurturing environment to help your child flourish and reach their potential? So you also have special units in mainstream. So it tends to be a unit attached to a mainstream school where there's a higher adult to child ratio. Additional qualifications and expertise are usually present. They usually have additional funding and so they have therapists, counsellors, EPs, equipment. You'll want to ask about inclusion in mainstream classes, if it's appropriate for now or later. 
And I suppose you'll want to ask about the integration strategy with mainstream, both educationally and socially for your child. Special schools, specialist provision is defined as specialist provision where needs can't be met in mainstream. So you need to consider the specialism that your child needs really carefully and the facilities of that school, the curriculum, the staff qualifications. And a lot of it will depend on how your child presents and what their specific issues are. Um, for example, if they have ASC, if they have dyslexia, that will inform the kind of specialist environments that might be suitable. They tend to have additional professionals like therapists, counsellors, visually impaired teachers, hearing impaired teachers. And in 2022, 34.8% of pupils with EHCP were in special school. Dual placements can be right for some children, but if your child struggles with transition or change, it could be hugely disruptive. So it's sometimes suggested that a dual placement is appropriate between special and mainstream schools, particularly for young children. Um, it's broadly believed that the complexity of attending two schools at secondary level can become a bit too challenging, not just for the child, but also for staff. Dual placement can be a good solution for a young child who needs a peer group of mainstream, but they need smaller groups and specialised input for learning. It requires lots of goodwill and communication on both sides. There can be logistical challenges, so I suppose a word of caution would be don't let your child fall between the two schools, or just keep an eye that that's not happening. So a kind of provision or PORUs, these are not special schools. Children who have more severe special educational needs or disabilities should not be sent to a PORU as a long-term solution. PORUs are for people who are unable to attend mainstream school. And there can be a variety of reasons for that. It covers primary and secondary age. 0.8% of pupils with a, a plan are in APs or PORUs. So the range of reasons can be the nature of their special educational needs, that this has meant that they're permanently excluded for behavioral reasons. Maybe there's been severe bullying, maybe emotional behavioral problems, perhaps school phobias, school refusers, anger management issues short or long-term issues, sorry, illnesses, or just that there's no placement. The child doesn't have a place anywhere else. It can be full-time, it can be split with mainstream, meant to be short-term measure, should be last resort. There are advantages. Um, they can be very highly qualified staff in these units with expertise in STEM. You get access to social workers, educational psychologists, counselors, tend to have small classes small classes. 14% have been rated as outstanding with Ofsted, but there are disadvantages, which can include a disruptive environment, very wide age range, just a whole range of issues that can mean that it's difficult to um, provide for such a wide range in one environment, and there can be a stigma attached. Um, PRUs don't have to teach the full national curriculum. They should aim to provide a broad and balanced education that covers as much of it as possible. Residential tends to be appropriate for children and young people with complex presentations, um, perhaps if they need a waking day curriculum to manage challenging behavior. Um, I mean, there can be other reasons why residential is appropriate, um, unique to each child and each family. I would urge you to consider the educational care and accommodation offerings of the, the range of residential placements, if that's what you're interested in and to reassure yourself that your child will have peers and that they have the expertise necessary to meet your child's needs. Moving on to home education, parents can choose to home educate their child. If this is what's right for them and their child, it can be a really positive step. Um, you just need to notify the school and the local authority of your intention if your child's got a plan. Um, I suppose a word of caution, parents can be encouraged and sometimes pressured to educate at home by schools and local authorities, even when the parents don't actually believe that's what the child needs. For example, some parents are worried about the repercussions of a poor attendance record and feel pushed into homeschooling. If you have a plan and you elect a homeschool, there is no further duty on the local authority to meet the provision in that plan. It's really important to remember that, which is why I've put it in red on the slide. So they do still have to review the plan, but they don't have to provide the provision set out in that plan, which is, can be huge for some children. 
So if homeschooling is being discussed, something isn't working, and think about what that is. Can something else be done? Would a different placement help? Um, is homeschooling really the best outcome? Does the plan need to be revised? I mean, if you don't have a plan, would a plan help this situation? It's preferable if you do decide to go down the road of homeschooling to have inserted in the plan education otherwise than at school, because that means the local authority must ensure the provision is still delivered, such as therapies. But if there's no plan in place and you elect to homeschool, then you don't need permission from the school or the local authority. But as I say, you might want to consider if an EHC needs assessment might be appropriate if a placement is breaking down because your child may have special educational needs. And then just some stats that in 2022, just slightly more than 4,000 pupils were electively home educated. So that's less than 1% of all EHCPs. Hospital schools is education for children who are inpatients. They're also covered by Ofsted. They should communicate with the SENCO of your child's school to make sure the curriculum is being covered insofar as possible. Communication is really key here between the hospital school and the child's usual school, and it's all about helping transition back into the usual school in due course. Post-16 institutions include school sixth form academies, sixth form colleges, further education institutions, adult community learning centres, and in 22, 16.6% .6 of pupils with EHCPs were in this, these kinds of further education. 19 plus. So a reminder that EHCPs can be in place up to the age of 25. They cover colleges and apprenticeships. I would just caution here um, that there tends to be a risk of local authorities ceasing to maintain EHCPs around this age. That's why it's really important in the annual review towards 19 that the goals in the plan really think about adulthood and the transition into adulthood and the independence goals that that young person wants to achieve because if you reach 19 and you've met your goals then the local authority may cease to maintain the plan and it can be quite difficult to to challenge that so think about the long-term future in those years leading up to 19 years of age universities um ehcps don't apply in universities it's often sensible to share a copy just so the university is aware of your needs but the university do have to make reasonable adjustments you may have access to a disabled student allowance and queries should be raised with a dis the disability officer. So choosing a school when you don't have an EHCP. So a child or young person who has then but no plan must be educated in mainstream education, except in very limited circumstances. And that can be, for example, for the purpose of an EHC needs assessment, some academies accept children without an EHCP to a special school or to post-16 academy institutions, but like I say, it's broadly mainstream if you don't have a plan. Places in units which are attached to mainstream fill up really quickly. They're usually in really high demand, so you're unlikely to get in there unless you have a plan. So without an EHCP, support will be through SEND support, which involves identifying your child's needs, making a plan, putting it in place, reviewing it, and if there's no progress or there's not the expected progress, then you press on with an EHC needs assessment. Choosing a school with a plan, so pupils with an EHCP are not subject to the usual admissions process. The local authority must review the plan and issue an amended plan by 15 Feb or 31 March, depending on if you're in what stage of education you're at. Um, you have a right to express a preference. The local authority will take your views into account when decisions are being made about what school can best meet your child's needs. And so your preference is likely, depending on where you are, to be a maintained school, an academy, a non-maintained special school, further education institution, or an independent school. Touching briefly on independent schools, if that is your preference. The onus is on parents to prove that none of the schools the local authority can offer can meet the child's needs or that cost will not reasonably constitute unreasonable public expenditure. So there's no obligation for your child to be placed in the best school for them. It's what is necessary is what the law states. 
if you want to go to an your child to go to an independent school, I would get professional advice from therapists, educational psychologists to support that placement. You may also want to get an education consultant to visit all of the other schools to work up clear evidence why they will not meet your child's need. All of that takes time, so I'd recommend starting that quite quickly and definitely over a year before your child is due to move. Because there can be delays in getting reports. You want to share those reports with this, the prospective school. You also want to make sure the school has time to accommodate some visits from you to meet your child. So it's definitely best to plan ahead. So time frames for school placements. You usually make your request following the annual review the year before your child moves. You also make a request when you get a draft EHCP, when there's an amendment notice amending the EHCP, or at any other time if an interim review is called or you feel like the school is not meeting your child's needs. When that happens, then the local authority consults the school governing body or principal. If they're maintained by another local authority, they will consult that local authority. The school has 15 days to respond, and if there's no response, the local authority can just proceed to name the school regardless. Then you get a final decision, and that lies with the local authority where your child lives. And then you'll be issued with a final EHCP, and in section I, that school will appear. And your appeal rights will be triggered at that point. So why might a local authority refuse to fund your preferred placement? They might say it's unsuitable for your child's special educational needs or that your child's attendance is incompatible with providing efficient education for others, or that it's incompatible with efficient use of resources. So your remedies at that point are to complain, or if it's named in an EHCP, to progress onto a tribunal hearing. And more details of that, as you know, are in my other seminar. So transition planning, annual reviews. Um, annual reviews, as you know, will when you have an EHCP, there's an annual meeting to review your needs, your child's needs, provision, goals, and their placement. There's going to be an annual review before each big transition. So early years to school, infant to junior, primary to middle, middle to secondary. Sorry, primary to secondary, middle to secondary, and secondary to post-16 and beyond. Transition planning is a crucial part of the process when choosing a school. If you're due to start primary school or move to secondary school, you have to consider the transition arrangements at the annual review during the last year of your current school. And it's usually in the first autumn term before you're due to move. And so the annual, the usual annual review process takes place. You have the meeting, there are proposed changes to the plan. In some circumstances, you get sent a draft plan. You've got 15 days to comment and to provide your school choice. And then a final plan will be issued with the placement put at section I of the plan. And as I say, at that point, your appeal rights are triggered. Um, I would say be ready well in advance of this annual review process to express your preferences. You want to be visiting schools well in advance of this, 18 months, perhaps more, before you're even in this meeting. If you have a sense that your preference is going to be challenged, you want to prepare really well for the transition review, you want to be ready to appeal basically, because you'll want to appeal promptly and you'll have to in light of the time frames for appeal, but in any case you'll want to appeal promptly because you'll want to try and get your child a place in the school that you prefer before the next school year starts. So you want as much evidence as possible to support the placement that you think is most suitable. In most circumstances, that means getting professionals in to consider your child and assess your child and to consider the school. Because if you're going to go to a peer, really you're going to need professionals such as educational psychology, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, to say that the other schools that the local authority say will meet your child's needs, will not meet their needs, and that only the school that you're putting forward is going to be able to meet their needs. So that's quite a lot of evidence to get there and it needs to be persuasive if you're going to appeal. So yes, before the annual review, be prepared, do your homework on school choices. 
until you have updating evidence, whether that be medical, NHS therapy reports, maybe diaries, videos, if your child's behavior has changed. Um, again, if you can have private reports and if you're in a position to fund those, that's great, do that. If you can invite the private therapist to attend the annual review, brilliant, that's also really helpful. You might want to get some input from an education consultant to help you visiting the schools in your local area, um, just to ascertain which ones can and can't meet your child's needs, but that's not possible financially for everybody. But I mean, if you could, if you can afford their input, that can be really helpful, although not essential. Um, we've touched already on why it's really important for goals to be stretching the child and you to have a really clear idea of what independence goals that you want your child to achieve are so that the schools that you want your child to go to can look at those and say, well, are we in a position to help this child meet those goals? Um, and when you've done all of that and visited the schools, um, it might be sensible to invite the Senko from your preferred school to the annual review. So when you're going around looking at all these schools, it can be helpful to have some placement tips in mind. Um, as I've said already, early planning is key to give you time to visit a number of schools. Um, have a checklist, have a table, a chart, a spreadsheet, whatever works for you to compare the different schools and how they read against each other and how they read against factors that are important to you and your child. You might want to do pros and cons, a summary of how you felt when you left, um, chart what your child's special educational needs are as set out in their plan and how that school could meet their needs. Have a list of questions. Don't be afraid to ask them. You need to know now, not later. Um, share information. So bring the EHCP, bring reports from professionals, bring medical reports. Explain what's working, what's not working. Um, what could they do to help address things that aren't working? Meet with the Senko and try and arrange your visit maybe on like quite a typical school day so you can really get a sense of what school life is like as it happens. If possible, maybe one visit with your child, one visit without. Ask about the number of um, pupils with an EHCP and how many are on SEND support. How many other children at the school with similar diagnosis to your child? Be open-minded, perhaps try not to rule out schools which may not have the best reputations without having visited them first, but also be realistic. What do you expect your child to be able to do when they leave school? So it's about being honest with yourself and then asking if the school is going to be the right place to help your child achieve that. Ask about how your child might be supported in sports lessons and clubs. What else is on offer outside the classroom? How would they be supported on school trips? What lunchtime and after school clubs are available? Would they be accessible to your child? If not, what adjustments can be made to make them accessible? What's the school's anti-bullying policy? How far away is the school? How would your child get there? Is fatigue a factor? Do you need to think about preserving energy for learning and not using it for traveling? You can get lots of information about the culture from documents that are readily available. So these can be things like the prospectus, Ofsted reports, the schools on website, their SEN inclusion policy, behavioral policy, complaints procedure, achievement and attainment tables, their magazine. So get an idea, are they academic driven? Are they more holistic? What, what's right for your child? Some other things to ask and look out for. Class size. Does the building echo? Is it noisy? Will that bother your child? Is it easy to navigate? Is it old? Are there lots of steps? Is your child a wheelchair user? How accessible is it? How far will they have to travel between classes or to lunch? Will this impact on fatigue? Look at the school, the general physical school environment to see if it's appropriate for your child. Are there any sort of noise, movement, lighting, sensory issues that need to be taken into consideration? What are the areas of recreation like? Are there sensory concerns there? Are they accessible? What's the main entrance like? Is there a quieter side entrance your child could use to avoid the hustle and bustle? How are lesson times heralded? Is it a klaxon? Would this upset your child? How can that be managed? Is there a safe and space, safe and quiet space for your child to retreat? Should the need arise? 
Are the school open to finding one if there's not one immediately obvious? Is there a therapy space? If there's not a dedicated therapy space, and often there isn't in schools, um, mainstream schools, for example, but there's a staff room, there's music rooms, there's sometimes empty classrooms, are they open to using spaces that are free to support your child? Have the conversation. You'll get a sense of how willing they are to accommodate your child. And you know, that's so important just to ask those questions because there will be issues that arise if your child's going to go to the school. So you need to know you can have an open and frank dialogue and that there's going to be a willingness to meet you in the middle. And also whilst you're walking around, I suppose, if it's going well, think about the provision that could be in your child's plan to help with any of the issues that this school might present. So I don't know, ear defenders for helping with the clocks and um, I know in primary schools, we've looked at quiet spaces being provided in the library, in the classroom, a little pop-up tent actually in the classroom, just to retreat away from the sensory overload and the hustle and bustle. Schools will sometimes allow you to observe classroom lessons. You can always ask, it might not be possible, but why not ask? Watch and listen and try and understand whether the teaching methods could be adapted um, to your child or if they need to be at all. Um, whether the academic levels expected would be suitable for your child. Also see what playtime is like and ask how progress is measured. Is it solely academic or is it more holistic than that? A few other things, do you feel welcome? Are the children engaged and upbeat? Does the school seem well organized? What are the displays like? Do they include children of all abilities? It's amazing how much you can just pick up from being in a space. So kind of look around you and absorb it. Staffing and training, how approachable and experienced is the cycle? What lines of communication can you have with, with them and their child's teachers and your child's teachers? How many of the school staff have specialist training in brain injuries? If so, what was that training? How recently was it undertaken? If they haven't had any, are they open to it? How are learning support assistance deployed? Are they used to increase independence rather than reduce it? What access do the school have to educational psychologists, specialist advisory teachers and therapists? Who are they and how often do they come in? How much time will they have with your child? And that's also linked then to maximizing provision in your child's education healthcare plan to lock in and secure specific slots of time with therapists. Specialist facilities, IT equipment. What kind of IT equipment does the school make available for children with SEN? Are there touch typing programs offered? Is there eye gaze? Is there software for voice recognition? Do they have sensory rooms, pools, quiet rooms, specialist equipment, rebound therapy, space for your child's own equipment? What experience does the school have of arranging extra support for children with special educational needs and exams, such as extra time, use of laptops, use of a prompt, use of a scribe, use of a quiet room? Are there systems in place to ensure children receive good notice of any changes in routine? And how are life skills and independence developed? That's really important. How do they support independence and transition into adulthood? What support would they offer post-16 post steps? What are their views on independent supported living? What do they do to develop independence skills? And social skills, are there any small group activities for developing social skills? How often do they meet? So these are all just some things to think about. They're going to vary massively according to your child and their needs, but hopefully they will serve as good prompts when you're considering placements. So what we covered today is the benefit of having an EHCP when choosing a placement, the type of school placements that are out there, the legal process and the time frame, and tips when you're visiting schools and things to look out for. And so I suppose I just finished by saying that choosing a school for a child with an acquired brain injury with special educational needs can be really daunting and it requires a lot of thought and quite a bit of work. Whilst there's probably no absolutely perfect school, it is about identifying which can best meet your child's needs and help them grow and flourish. Um, I think it's also just about the culture of the school and the can-do attitude and you feeling that you can develop a good rapport with them and work well with them. I really hope that this was helpful for those of you who are considering school placements or at times of transition or if you're thinking that the current placement isn't suitable and thinking about changing your child's school. 
I'd put my contact details there. Um, if I can help, I'd be very happy to. Questions about EHCPs and appeals will hopefully be covered in my other seminar, um, Protecting Your Child's Education Rights and Introduction to EHCPs. So I wish you all the very best in your search for a school placement, and I do hope that this was helpful in your journey. Thank you.